Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Data Bytes here at the Institute for Government, kindly supported by the Legal <coughs> Education Foundation. My name is Gavin Freegard. I'm Program Director here at the IFG, responsible for data and digital government, and it's wonderful to welcome so many of you to our sixth Data Bytes event. Now, hands up if you've not been to one of these before. Welcome, first timers. <laughs> hands up if you have been before. Keep those hands raised if you've been to two. Three, four, five, and all six. I think, I think Simon over there deserves a round of applause for making it to all six. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, we are on the record and we are being live streamed, so hello to anybody watching us online tonight. We will be tweeting from at IFG events using the hashtag IFG Databyte, so please do get involved. And for those of you in the room, you can get onto the Wi-Fi network. It's IFG underscore guest, username IFG, and password visitor. So it's been a month since we last met, and obviously it's been yet another quiet month <laughs> in British politics. Uh, last month, we were waiting for Parliament to be prorogued, and nobody knew what was going to happen with Brexit. Today, we're waiting for Parliament to be prorogued, and nobody knows what's going to happen with Brexit. Um, our parliamentary monitor team, who analyse parliamentary data, thought they had a complete data set a few weeks ago. They're just going to have to wait a few days extra. Now, you will be used to our famous ministerial resignation chart, uh, showing you May with her record number 36. Johnson, Boris Johnson, had got onto the scorecard last time we met. And if you keep your eye on that little line down in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see that since we last met, there have been two more ministerial resignations, his own brother and Amber Rudd. So again, a uh, rather bit of turmoil in British politics. There's also been yet another change to the composition of the House of Commons. This is what the Commons looked like at the 2017 general election. Keep your eyes peeled on the middle. This is what it looks like now. I think since we last met, there's been another defection to Liberal Democrats and another suspension in the Labour Party. So again, I think quite a good visual representation of where British politics is at the moment. <coughs> Would anybody like to guess what this chart is showing us? No? Uh, this is showing you the length of speeches uh, from the party <laughs> conference season. You can see Boris Johnson ahead of Joe Swinson, ahead of Jeremy Corbyn. I was just basically looking for a visual representation of party conference season. I was thinking about alcohol consumption in Bournemouth, Brighton and Manchester, or the bags under my eyes, having gone to all three of those conferences. Or of course this wonderful one from the Financial Times, uh, which shows the proximity of coffee to the Prime Minister over time. And I, I would recommend that you check out the online version of that, uh, which is animated. Now, the Prime Minister has actually been talking in his speech today about sort of digital and data issues. He talked about gigabit broadband spreading across the country like tendrils of super informative vermicelli, which is quite colourful. Um, he was also at the United Nations last week talking in quite colourful language, literally. We've got the IFG blue, pink and purple there, uh, about various things to do with data, you know, a dark thundercloud, will it be helpful robots or terminators, and data being the crude oil of the modern economy. Now, I know... Those of us working on data don't particularly like the data is the new oil metaphor, but obviously good to see a Prime Minister engaging with technology. Perhaps he's had some lessons. <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I can quite get away with that, but I tried. Um, <laughs> a few other things before I introduce tonight's event. Um, we also published a few sort of data-related publications over the last few weeks. Um, this shows you um, sort of a report we had on Northern Ireland. Also published something on how the Treasury could use data more effectively when it comes to assessing public spending. We also published something on procurement and outsourcing, um, something we've had a long-standing interest in, particularly when it comes to better data, as well as our parliamentary monitor snapshot, uh, which we trailed last time out. So why are we doing this? Why data bytes? Well, we want to bring together different communities across government. We want to show leaders what better data actually means and what it could achieve. And we want to put best practice in some really interesting projects on the record. Now, for those of you who've not been here before, this is how this evening is going to work. You will see four presentations on exciting government data projects. Each speaker will have eight minutes to present. Yes, eight minutes. You will see the countdown clock there ominously ticking us down towards zero, uh, just in front of Legal Education Foundation banner, reminding you that there are supporters tonight. Once we've had the eight minutes from each speaker, oh, well, from the first speaker, we'll have eight minutes of question and answer. I will start the timer for you, the audience, to start as soon as the first question starts to be asked. And then we'll move on to the next speaker. So an eight-minute presentation, eight minutes of questions, and then on to the next speaker. 
This is the sixth, so we've already had a number of brilliant evenings and lots of wonderful presentations. We had Louisa from the ONS Data Science Campus on faster indicators of economic activity. Paul from Mahoka Logo, we're determined to get that to stick, uh, talking about digital land and data. David from Vocalink, who had some wonderful visualizations about fraud. Uh, and then Sophie and John from Ofgem, talking about analytics there. Then we had Alex from DWP talking about uh, new digital services. Sarah and Sam talking about the DCMS data ethics framework. Simon talking about personal data exchange. RHE Global talking about citizen science. Am I going to get through all of these without forgetting anybody? We will see. William from the Geospatial Commission. Andy talking about data on the web. We had Luke and David talking about Bayes' data science project. Yvonne from the NAO trailing their report on the challenges of using data across government. Then we had Catherine from the Office for Statistics Regulation. Jane talking about the Newham Data Warehouse. We had Ganesh from GDS talking about using machine learning to help users find content. And we had Michael from the... Um, CDC Day talking about the AI barometer. And finally, if the slide ever loads, we had Ollie from Indessa talking about identifying vulnerable public service users. Emma from ADR talking about using administrative data more effectively across government. Graham from the Cabinet Office talking about fraud. And then we had Sam talking about the future of data at the Ministry of Justice. So those are all the presentations we've had so far. <laughs> Um, we've had a fantastic lineup, as you can see, but I'm really excited about tonight's lineup, which I'm going to introduce you to now. First, we'll have the brilliant Sean Sheridan, Digital Director of the National Archives, talking about legislation as data. He will be followed by D Dr. Natalie Byram, who will be talking about this, uh, the report that should be on all of your chairs today, talking about HMCTS, their data strategy and access to justice. Then we'll have Adam Locker from the Food Standards Agency. Now, those of you who've been to a lot of these events will know that people often talk about fixing the plumbing when it comes to government data. You will see that Adam is going to tell us how to solve all of that tonight, which is very <laughs> exciting. And last but not least, we will have Ben Coleman from the National Audit Office talking about the NAO's data service, a sort of solution to a lot of those plumbing issues that we see across government. The next one of these will hopefully be on the 6th of November, Wednesday the 6th. Um, I say hopefully, I'll come back to that in a second. We've already got some wonderful presenters lined up for that one, uh, but please do get in touch with me if you would like to pitch a presentation or know somebody that we should be asking to present. And finally, if you are interested in supporting the series, we are looking for sponsors and funders. Please do get in touch with my colleague David on the longest email address known to the Institute. <laughs> And with 14 seconds to spare, whew, um, I'm going to hand over to our first presenter tonight. I'll just wait for that to count down. I'd like to introduce John Sheridan. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John Sheridan. I'm the Digital Director at the National Archives. I'm going to talk to you about legislation as data. Um, to convince you right up front, here is um, the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 encoded in the legal document markup language. Um, it's a format called a coma and toso. Now, when we think about the law, legislation, and data, there's a few basic ideas it's important to understand. The law is both legislation and the common law, case law. And what legislation does, a piece of legislation changes the law from one state to a new state. Now when we are representing a piece of legislation as data, we're not modelling the whole of the law. That would be really, really hard. What we're doing is modelling the document, in particular the parts of the document that we care about that help convey legal meaning, and we're modelling parts of the document that we care about in terms of the law. So for us particularly, information about amendments. We use a tree-like structure in XML for the documents, and we use a graph-like structure for modelling all of the amendments. Now, what glues all of our data together is quite a sophisticated scheme using URLs. Um, and that allows us to link and connect the documents as they're changing over time and as they apply to different parts of the UK in different ways, 
with data about what parts of the law are doing, particularly data about amendments. And the URL scheme for legislation at gov.uk um, is kind of a symphony to the power of URLs um, for allowing you to bring together document-oriented information and data. Now, where this really comes into its own is when you're dealing with the kind of challenge that we've been dealing with um, in relation to some, to some of our responsibilities under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Now, very briefly, this repeals European Communities Act 1972, and it's like turning the power off to a whole body of law. So what the Act does is it deals with the consequences of repealing the 1972 Act by incorporating law that currently directly applies to the UK into the UK domestic statute book. So regulations like the General Data Protection Regulation become incorporated as domestic law under this Act. Now, we um, have been given a job to do under this Act, which is to make available to the public the legislation that's being incorporated into the domestic statute book. Now, we've been working to support government departments because we have a bunch of tools for managing legislation, fulfilling our duty under that Act, and aiding legal certainty as the UK leaves the EU. And we've launched two services, a large archive of European law, which is like a static collection um, taken from the Eurlex website, the European Commission's website. And we've been adding European legislation to legislation.gov.uk. Now, um, it looks easy. In practice, taking this body of European legislation and domesticating it is quite a big data transformation job. Um, thankfully, there's a lot of data that's on the ULX website. There's data both about the documents, a lot of classification metadata, and a lot of amendment data that we can use as a source. But it's not always obvious when you're working with somebody else's data what you need to choose. So our Withdrawal Act talks about EU decisions. What's a decision? You have to really understand the data. And the documents are modelled in a different way from how we model UK legislation documents. So we've had to transform the documents from the European data model into the UK data model so that we can then apply the amendments that the UK is making to produce the UK applicable versions of this newly incorporated legislation. So a big data transformation job. Now, in doing that, and you can see all of this on the legislation.gov.uk website, if you go to browse and then legislation originating from the EU, you see that we're able to add quite a lot of value in terms of how the legislation is presented um, by translating it into our model. So here is GDPR, um, and you can see that we have a table of contents. It's not a thing that you find on ULX. We've also, um, this is Article 2, we've also brought together um, the amendments that the UK has made, or is proposing to make for exit day, with the text that's being modified and a timeline that's showing people, as far as we know, what we expect to happen. Um, so here at GDPR, we run into EU exit day on the 31st of the 10th, 2019. So this is bringing together EU documents, UK documents, EU data about amendments, and UK data about amendments into a single platform. Now, having all this data about amendments means we can do some quite interesting analysis um, on the impact of EU exit on our own domestic statute book. So here you can see the drop in the number of amendments to UK primary legislation and the increase in amendments to UK secondary legislation. If you look at what we're doing with amendments to EU legislation, this red line is the EU amending EU legislation and the hockey stick diagram is the number of amendments that the UK's EU exit SIs are making to that incorporated body of EU law. Um, here's a glimpse at who's doing the work. So um, DEFRA and HMT have been very busy. 
Um, and here's a glimpse at what the pattern of amendments are. So is it that we, there's like a one-to-one -one relationship on the whole, one UK piece of legislation amending one EU piece of legislation. In terms of amending our own domestic legislation, then again we can see that the amendments made for EU exit are largely for these red bars, these are statutory instruments, recent statutory instruments, the blue bars are UK primary legislation. So again, having all of this amendment information means that we can see a lot about the pattern of how the UK is changing its statute book for EU exit. Now, we're preparing for multiple scenarios at the moment. Um, uh, we're currently syncing both documents and amendment data from ULX every day onto legislation.gov.uk. And we've built what I can only describe as a data clutch between these two data sets of law, UK law and EU law, so that in the case that there is a no deal exit, we can disengage the clutch and apply the UK amendments and produce UK applicable texts. In the case of a deal, we can flexibly shift gear and synchronise where we need to continue synchronising. So imagine goods for Northern Ireland, legislation around that we can synchronise um, and disengage where we don't need to synchronise. Um, it's quite a sophisticated mechanism, but we are ready for whatever comes our way this month. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Lots of questions, I'm sure, in the audience. Um, I'm going to take them in groups of two or three. Do tell us who you are and where you're from. And remember, we're on the record. And please do keep it short, because I will start the timer as soon as we start asking the first question. So who would like to ask a question? Got one here. There must be more. Let's go with this first one to, to kick us off. Hi, yes, uh, Joe Dilger, Data Protection Officer, University of Winchester. Particularly interested in one of your last comments um, in terms of the uh, Boris Johnson's proposals today in terms of Northern Ireland, etc. Could you talk a little bit more in terms of how the National Archives would handle that in terms of um, if a part of the UK uh, had to be different for whatever reason? Okay. Thank you. So we're really fortunate that we've built a model for the complexity of um, the UK as it is with its primary and secondary legislation. So we've got three different legal systems with four different jurisdictions and a statute book that everyone's modifying in different ways. So we already have a really good model for dealing with legal jurisdictional extent. So where the text, a single text may be um, amended in different ways for Northern Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales. Um, so that's already in our core model. By bringing the European legislation into that model, um, we can then allow it to be um, essentially the model will support it being fragmented um, in line with um, however the parliaments, assemblies and governments of the UK choose to amend it. Great. Basically just treating it like UK primary legislation and it's already a problem solved. Excellent. More questions? I've got one down the front here. I think we've got one at the back there as well. Let's take uh, this one first and then at the back. So. Uh, Sui Lang Harris from the Legal Education Foundation. Um, we've heard a lot of talk about the work that the government had to do to uh, make all of the necessary SIs for Brexit and just curious about how uh, the system that you have created has been coping with the peaks and troughs of SIs coming through and, and the associated amendments they're making to retain DU law. Thank you. And right at the back there. Yeah, um, it's sort of, uh, the graphs you showed were really interesting. I think it's really, the really interesting bit for me as an analyst is that sort of piece around what's, what's amending what and how's it all changing. Um, I saw a presentation a few years back by um, somebody from GitHub uh, who had been doing some work with the French government and they basically created essentially a GitHub style approach to demonstrating how the, the, the law had been written and amended so you could see all the amendments as sort of separate commits and things. And I was just wondering, sort of having engaged with legislation.gov.uk occasionally, whether there was anything about the way in which you could present it 
more as an educational piece rather than, as well as being a legal reference uh, to sort of help people like the public navigate sort of what's been going on, what is changing really. Okay, thank you. So to the first question, um, we had to make a lot of adaptations to our um, tools that are used for drafting legislation because for the first time we see UK statutory instruments modifying EU legislation and those documents have a very different structure. So if you're changing something that's got a different structure, you now need to support those structures in your drafting tools and in your data models. So we had to figure out what all of that needed to look like, adapt the tools and get it into the hands of um, SI drafters in time. And we then had to stress test our publishing system and um, particularly because we're responsible for registering statutory instruments, um, that puts us between making and laying in the process for SIs, um, needing to make sure that we could do that um, really quickly um, so that um, we could support government departments when they were um, under pressure to get their legislation through. Um, and um, we made sure that we had a capability to deal with um, eye-watering peaks. Um, in the event, none of my worst-case scenarios have, have come to fruition in terms of either the number of amendments or the numbers of pieces of legislation we were planning for and could have coped with um, quite a lot more than what we've seen. Um, to the question about um, GitHub um, and education, um, so I think that UK legislation is way more complicated than what you can manage using um, simple, simple version control through something like GitHub. Um, uh, commencement in particular is um, incredibly difficult, um, or can be, um, in terms of uh, what's brought into force, where, when, for what purpose, and all of those things can be varied. Um, and we've had to do a lot of work in our models to deal with that kind of complexity. In terms of aiding um, users, we know that one of the big challenges with presenting legislation is that many people who are working with the service, and we see up to 100,000 users a day on legislation at the UK, so there's a lot of people looking at this content, um, is that they, many of them lack the mental model to be able to work with legislation. Um, we've got plans underway to try and present the content in a way that helps fill out the elements of the mental model that the user might lack um, so that we can help people better perhaps understand um, the law that they're looking at um, and what it means and what its status is. Um, the timelines in particular, and especially in the context of EU exit, and especially if things get complicated with the transition and with different things happening in different parts of the UK, are going to be really key, and we've done quite a lot of work on how we develop those timelines um, to give clear messaging about how the law is changing over time for different parts of the country. And those, some of those things have tested really well with users. Um, and it'll be interesting what you'll be looking at on legislation at the gov.uk come November. We've got time for a few more very quick ones. Uh, gentleman there, lady there, and the gentleman there. Got one minute and 48 uh, Aaron seconds. Aaron Nelson from BDB Pittman's occasional drafter of legislation. I'd be interested to just pick up on a point you made about um, the idea of putting your tools in the hands of statutory instrument drafters during the course of production of the instrument. Can you talk a bit more about that? Because I'd be interested to know how that works um, in terms of the ability to automate, if that's what you're talking about, the drafting process in some way. And we've got the lady there. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Kira, Ministry of Justice. Um, I was just hoping you could say a little more about how you treat the devolved SI specifically and how you can sort of flag and treat some of the legislation that's devolved versus not. You've mentioned a few times the different systems in the UK. Thank you. And the gentleman two rows back there. Stephen Chani, I see about to be an ex-civil servant. Um, you've built a lovely engine for ingesting the products of legislative machines. Given that you've got a gearbox, can it go into reverse and help the generation of superior legislation? Thank you. Drafting tools, big conversation. Let's talk about that over drinks. <laughs> 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 
Um, I'm going to... It's a huge topic. Um, lots of different drafting tools. We're developing a new drafting tool in partnership with UK Parliament, Scottish Parliament, um, Parliamentary Council and the Scottish Government at the moment. Um, big topic. Uh, for um, devolved legislation, there are two things that we do. Um, there's um, different types of legislation that are made by the devolved administration, so Scottish statutory instruments, and they essentially are part of a separate series. Um, and similarly, Welsh statutory instruments will be labelled with a W, um, and they'll have their own numbering series. Um, so you can find, if you like, the amending legislation by its type. Um, the part that is more sophisticated is we record the legal jurisdictional extent of every part of the document. Um, and that's one of the features on um, legislation.gov.uk. So if I go back here, show geographical extent. And that's already baked in for the UK version of GDPR um, and for all of the other legislation that we've incorporated. Um, so this extent model allows the legislation to be varied for different parts of the UK, even at the level of an article of a regulation. Um, and that's one of the kind of core features in our model. Um, and it's actually provided for in the URI scheme. So um, if you want to reference the UK version of GDPR on the 1st of January 2020, as it extends to England and Wales, there is already a URL for that, even though we don't know what that text will say right now. Um, but if you wanted to make a statement about it somewhere, um, maybe in terms of building a model for the law somewhere else, then there's already a URL for that. Um, and that's the power of URLs. Uh, Gearbox into reverse. Um, so the gearbox isn't going to do that. But the opportunities in terms of, once you get to where we have, in terms of analytics, um, understanding the statute book as a system, what we're modifying, where and why. Is legislation wearing out in some areas more quickly than others in order to be able to see the whole system um, and start to work with it more effectively? and potentially understand where legislation is working very well and how you might abstract that, the potential is enormous. And we now have the world's best database for EU legislation. Um, uh, and some of the best analytical tools. Um, so um, I'd say let's just knock ourselves out. <laughs> John, thank you very much indeed. Next, we have Natalie. Hello. So, my name is Dr. Natalie Byram, and I'm Director of Research at the Legal Education Foundation. I'm here today, as you might have guessed, to talk to you about our new report, Digital Justice, which sets out a 29-point plan for putting access to justice at the heart of the data strategy the courts and tribunals service are developing to support their ongoing programme of court reform. At the Foundation, we believe it's vital that people are able to understand and use the law, which means that decisions about reforms to the processes people use to secure their rights must be based on good data and robust evidence. At the present time, decisions of this nature are being made at pace as the £1 billion programme of court reform moves towards completion in 2023. How many people are lawyers here or know something about court reform? Okay, so in the minority. It's nice. Um, the reform programme that's currently underway um, is unprecedented in scale, it's unprecedented in scope, and it's unprecedented in speed. By 2023, the aim is to deliver a reformed justice system and reduce the demand for physical hearings by creating online end-to-end -end processes. Whilst austerity has been described as the motivator behind the reform programme, it's not the goal. The senior judiciary, who, operate, who occupy a leadership role in respect of reform, have set out a number of principles against which reform services should be measured and, if successful, implemented. 
The first of these is to ensure that reform systems maintain or improve access to justice. And for researchers, that looks to me like an empirical question. The reform programme, it's fair to say, has been subject to a considerable degree of external scrutiny, and the Public Accounts Committee, the National Audit Office and the Justice Select Committee have all variously called on HMCTS and MOJ to evaluate the impact of reform on access to justice, particularly as it relates to vulnerable users. In addition, successive announcements on data and the scale of the investment in reform has led to heightened interest from the research community and beyond for the potential for reform to address acknowledged issues with the justice data landscape. So, in 2018, I was appointed as expert advisor on open data and academic engagement to help HMCTS to deliver a more nuanced understanding of the data required to meet their commitments around measuring access to justice, stakeholder needs and expectations in relation to justice system data, and to inform debate around models and mechanisms for data sharing. I consulted with 60 expert stakeholders and published interim findings which were subject to a period of public consultation to arrive at the recommendations which are in the report that you've all had on your seats. So what were the key findings? Um, what, does, what data needs to be collected to ensure that digitised processes improve access to justice and that digitised processes comply with obligations under the Equality Act? In short, we need better data on the individuals who use the justice system, particularly data that enables conclusions to be drawn regarding the compliance of new systems with the public sector equality duty. We need better data on whether or not reformed processes deliver against the legal definition of access to justice, which consists of access to the formal legal system, access to an effective hearing, access to a decision in accordance with the law and access to remedy. This diagram um, shows how this, how this definition maps in practice to an existing reform service and in the report there's set out the types of data that you would need to collect and monitor to check that reformed processes are delivering on these aims. Most importantly we need data on outcomes. Where do people drop out? Which people drop out? What outcomes do people secure? And are biases in being introduced? Um, you might all ask, looking at this as technocratic, why does it matter? And it matters because for many people, especially those who are vulnerable people, the justice system is a vital safety net, not least when you're at the sharp end of government decision making. In a recent speech, the senior president of tribunals, Sir Ernest Ryder, reported that if you bring an appeal against a decision made in relation to a subset of disability benefits, there's a 73% likelihood of success. That means initial government decision making is wrong in 73% of cases. In this context, it's of paramount importance that the justice system remains accessible to all those who need it. Better data and iteration in support of access to justice is the key to ensuring this. Beyond access to justice, the research undertaken in preparing this report revealed that reform is being conducted in the context of a data landscape that was described by stakeholders as being um, dysfunctional, with the notable exception of legislation.gov.uk. So <laughs> nice one, John. <laughs> Some of the issues that were uncovered include opaque and differential arrangements for accessing data that is formally public, restricted access providers charging for data that in theory should be available under the principles of open justice, an absence of data asset registers and data catalogues, processes for accessing current data for research that are not compliant with good practice, the lack of a common language for talking about data generated by the justice system. This is really problematic because it impedes a balanced discussion. The report proposes an initial framework which sets out a typology for how we might think about the different types of data that justice systems produce, but I'd welcome thoughts on how that might be developed. There's a lack of an evidence-based approach to weighing the benefits and risks and balancing the competing principles at stake when we talk about making more justice system data open, and that's a real gap. Um, there's also a real problem around, there's a lacuna around ownership and leadership of this issue. So what needs to be done? Next steps on data collection. There is an urgent need to publish access to justice impact assessments for each reformed service alongside a data collection and analysis plan. Reformed services should not be signed off without leadership judges and others having sight of data to demonstrate that the principles they've set out are being met. The most recent report published by the NAO further recommended that HMCTS should put in place structures to ensure learning about services. Learning about how services are impacting those that are using them is 
fed into the development of new services. Better data is key to meeting this recommendation. There's also an urgent need to develop good practice in collecting demographic and equalities data across digital service. So that's not just courts, that's universal credit, that's settled status, that's the whole, um, the whole panoply of digital government services. And furthermore, we need a clear mandate to compel the adoption of this good practice. Next steps on reforming arrangements for accessing justice system data. There's an urgent need to raise the profile of the issues raised in this report, many of which are sensitive and, can, and raise important constitutional questions. It's very easy to become distracted in all the other important constitutional questions that we're facing at the moment, um, but this really is vital that this issue is grasped. It's vital to remember that whilst the administration of justice is a partnership between ministers and judges, the delivery of justice is the sole responsibility of the independent judiciary. That the judiciary are and must be independent from government has been somewhat underscored by recent events. So, in closing, this report marks the beginning, not the end, of a discussion about the way forward. Digitisation forces us to confront tensions between competing principles and interests that have to date been managed through the functional opacity of the current system. The issues are difficult, but they're of vital importance, and for this reason they must be addressed head on and not ignored. So who should be addressing them? Well, in my view, the next stage of this work should be taken forward through a transparent working party, ideally chaired by a judge or former judge, with knowledge of and connection to the academic community, an understanding of the justice system data from an operational perspective, and a deep knowledge of the reform program. Immediate tasks for this working party include an analysis of the existing legal duties and responsibilities in relation to the dissemination of justice system data. That's everything from data from research, so micro-level data, to judgments, and a better understanding of how these um, duties and responsibilities play out in practice. The working party should look to create a formal of memorandum and, sorry, the working group should create a formal memorandum of understanding between the different parties involved and work to develop a dynamic evidence-based plan for the future. And the thoughtful work currently being undertaken by the National Archives into a risk-based model for gradated access could be, employed, uh, could be deployed here. And I would urge people um, who are interested in this to talk to John more about that approach. Um, thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to taking questions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, questions for Natalie. We've got the lady there. Any others in the first round? Uh, gentleman at the back. And let's start with those two. Uh, Caroline Shepherd from the Traffic Penalty Tribunal. Okay. Uh, we've met before. One of the problems with the court reform process at the moment is that they don't have an end-to-end -end system. And until they've got in one of their jurisdictions, an end-to-end -end process, so that you've actually got the data of how people relate to it all through, and indeed the outcome. It seems that you've actually got one hand tied behind your back with this. Are you making any progress with persuading at least one small branch of the courts or tribunals to actually pilot an end-to-end -end system so that you can then start drawing the data from there? Thank you very much, and the gentleman at the back. Um, most reports like this promise sort of a wonderful new world and deliver, you know, nothing at all. Uh, this report seems to go out of its way to be deeply practical and ground itself in existing law, which I don't think has been seen since a recent perspective from Lady Hale. So given the grounding in the principles of the rule of law, existing requirements, existing obligations already on public bodies, and while your remit was courts and justice, to what extent do the legal obligations you outline apply only to the courts, or do they apply across all the rest of the public sector as well? Thank you very much. Right. So, Caroline, thank you so much for coming. It's lovely to see you again. And um, to your point on end-to-end -end processes, I, I think that is um, a real challenge. One of the things that's been absent actually so far is even um, publication at even a level of kind of a theory of change perspective of uh, documents setting out what do we think these projects are going to do to each of the four elements of access to justice, 
who are our users? It's just not in the public domain. And I think the absence of having that kind of fine-grained plan that sort of looks at what are we trying to achieve, what does this mean for users, is really problematic. Um, I think the point about, I mean, enter and pilots, it's, it's quite... I mean, I don't really know what to say. I'm, I don't work for HMCTS. My remit was to look at their data stuff. I think um, increasingly they're moving towards that in phase three. But as phase four, as I understand it, is all about going live and shifting to operational mode, you would be thinking that these pilots would be coming out quite soon. Uh, my own view is that it's vitally important that these sort of data collection analysis plans are put in place now, otherwise this opportunity is just going to be completely missed and we're not going to be in a better position than when we started. Um, on the question about do the legal obligations uh, extend across government, I mean, I think one of the things that we were really shocked about um, at the front was despite the public sector equality duty, the lack of good practice in existing models, particularly in digital systems, for actually collecting the data that would enable you to monitor to any meaningful degree the impact of digitizing services on people with protected characteristics, um, the fact that you don't have gender data on the settled status scheme, the fact that we're still not sure what's going on in terms of universal credit. And I, I mean, my understanding is that people in government are working hard to try and harmonise and collect better data, but with no political mandate to impose this on services across government, it does become quite difficult. Some people have mooted that what's needed is a reform to the public sector, um, sorry, to the Equality Act to compel the collection of better data, but I guess in the current climate it's difficult to predict how that might play out. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Great. Uh, next set of questions. Uh, lady at the back, um, the other lady at the back, gentleman here, and let's see the gentleman here as well. Let's get four in. Why not? Um, hi, my name's Nicola. Um, I'm a master's student doing politics at Birkbeck University. Um, but for context, I also used to work for the Equality and Human Rights Commission, so I'd like to follow up on the previous thing about equalities. Um, I was really interested about, obviously, the data collection on demographic inequalities, which I agree is totally vital. But I wondered if you had any thoughts about how it would actually be done, because often it's self-reporting and there's an issue of trust, for example, with certain demographic groups, you know, on immigration issues to actually report accurately perhaps what their um, demographic group is. And also further to that, is there any going to be any look at income inequality, for example, as a separate group? I know that's not a protected characteristic, but it's of interest. Thank you. And if you'd just like to pass it along there. Hi, um, I'm a, a I work as an investigative journalist, but also do my own research on issues that come up when I'm, when I'm researching stories. So I was interested in the point five of your recommendations that HMCTS should publish and consult on the cost and effort associated with initiating and defending a claim. Uh, because I often come across individuals who have had costs escalate and escalate in legal proceedings to the point where they are just completely ruined. Um, so I was just wondering if you have anything extra to say about that issue. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks. Hi, uh, Sam Tazimad, Ministry of Justice. Um, I think your report's really interesting and very timely. Um, there's a lot of stuff here about releasing data externally, but of course this uh, whole reform program is also a lot about internal uses of data. I wondered uh, if you had any comments about whether there should be more thought or whether any recommendations about principles that could be applied to data sets for their use internally, and also um, any comments on what skills might be need to be recruited into the organization to help this. Thank you. And the gentleman in the second row down here. Hi, I'm Devon, the Director of Policy and Practice. We do a lot of work with government administrative data, and I've spoken with Natalie about uh, uh, bits of this uh, ahead of the publication of the report. And one of the conversations we had uh, and I think this ties into other questions, was the, the trade-off between collecting this data in order to monitor equalities versus perhaps the business imperative of getting people online to use it as quickly as possible. And I think you're about to have a conversation with MOJ about that. So I'd be curious to know kind of how that, how that trade-off is perceived internally and, and kind of how to best balance it. Thank you. So, Natalie, 90 seconds. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Good luck. 
Thank you very much. Right, so self-reporting and trust, that's absolutely an issue that we're conscious of. Unfortunately, um, it becomes a vicious cycle, doesn't it? Because people suspect that the justice system is racist, therefore they're reluctant to want to hand over information about their ethnicity. I guess what we're looking for in these, um, what we have proposed is a, is a self-reporting mechanism because it's not clear to me that there are other ways that you could do that that would be particularly ethical either, unless you have the data through, through other means. Um, what you would hope is, as systems get better at publishing data that shows that actually race isn't taken into account in that way, because that's what you would hope would happen, right? And then it becomes less of an issue. I guess the other point is that we're not looking for like 100% completion. What we need is enough of a response rate to be able to indicate, hang on a second, there's something going wrong here. Um, one of the recommendations in the report around vulnerability is around income, because we are very concerned about that and your right to raise it, incomes related to um, access to, uh, to digital exclusion, for example. So that has been raised and still thinking through how that might be developed in practice. On um, cost and effort, now that's because one of the, the existing data plan that HMCTS have set up <coughs> has said that one of the metrics that they are interested in measuring is the cost and effort involved in um, initiating claims what we wanted to do is to get them to expand more on what do they mean by that. Some of that might be about, well, we think the systems are so easy that people aren't getting legal advice, which costs money. Um, but again, it's not, how do you work out whether people aren't seeking legal advice because the system is actually easy or because, for example, in research that you've seen from other jurisdictions, one of the issues with taking a formal legal process and putting it online is people no longer perceive it as as important and definitive as it is. There's good studies from the states looking that when people in um, immigration detention settings were asked to um, sort of defend their cases through um, video hearings, what happened was that they didn't perceive the process as authoritative, so they didn't seek legal help, so they got worse outcomes. Um, so I think it's important to look at that. Oh gosh, on the principle of supplied for data use internally and skills, I think that's a whole other piece of work that we're really keen to see taken forward. Um, in terms of, I mean, it would be great to pick up with you after so what exactly you mean by principles and what the current barriers are within MOJ to actually analysing some of this data. There's going to need to be a data sharing agreement in place between HMCTS and MOJ to facilitate the evaluation of reform because that's been tasked to MOJ. I don't, it's not clear to me that that's in place yet, what that would look like, so I'd be clean to understand that further. Business imperative and trade-off, well, one of the, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right, but I guess the two points that I would make are, one, if you are in lots of areas of the justice system, like welfare benefits, like um, special educational needs, you're not going to be put off, the, the issue is of such importance that if ticking protected characteristics questionnaires are going to sort of put you, I, I just don't think it's a reasonable thing to say that actually this will have a, a massive deterrent effect. I think the other point is, to, in a, to put it in a more positive way, when new processes are introduced um, and people don't know what that looks like, um, they look to what are the outcomes that people get from those processes when deciding whether to use them. The business case for reform is predicated on people choosing to adopt the digital channel in preference to the paper channel. If HMCTS gets better at collecting this information and publishing the information showing that people get parity of outcome or that the outcome is slightly lower if we're talking about financial settlement but you get it much quicker, then that helps people to make informed choices about which process and ideally that should help with channel shift. Um, but again, I'd be really interested to talk further afterwards. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll go. Thank you. Next, fixing the plumbing, we have Adam. Hello. Uh, my name's Adam Locker and I'm the data architect at the Food Standards Agency. And I'm not here this time to talk to you about one of our really cool data projects. I promise you we have lots of them. And I also promise that I will send someone along who's both involved in those and cool to talk about one at a future date. I want to try and cheer you up a little bit, sort of. I attended this event a few months ago 
And the thing that most people were talking about afterwards was the report from the National Audit Office. The TLDR was data, 30 years of hurt. <laughs> and I think it made some of us feel a little bit down in the dumps. That this stuff should be easier and we're not making any progress. I don't think we're there yet. But we are getting there and it is worth reminding ourselves why some of this stuff is difficult. Here are some lessons we've learned at the FSA. Please remember, we're very small. Let's start with everybody's favourite, standards. There's an XKCD for everything. Who recognises this scenario? Here's one of the reasons I think this happens so frequently. This is ISO 8601, the standard for dates and times, one of the building blocks of good data. It's a popular standard. I'm sure we all dream of writing one of those, a bit like a data hit single. Now, imagine this is the uh, first time you've ever heard of this. What do ISO say about it? Fair play, ISO, fair play, very succinct. This sounds like something I can get on board with. But we need a little more to understand if this is useful. So far, so good. I particularly like, what can ISO 8601 do for me, <laughs> to the point. So let's say you want to dig in so you can become the authority on date and time formatting in your organisation. Let's take a quick look at the table of contents. Crikey, it's got annexes. <laughs> now, I appreciate this is a piece of reference work and it's not the kind of day-to-day -day reading you would expect to do. But at some point, someone is going to have to read this in your organisation. And this is one basic standard. Just understanding the landscape of data standards has an enormous overhead to it. Now, you'll often hear the plug socket analogy when people are talking about standards, but I prefer to think of the universal serial bus because I'm a massive nerd. Now, since its release in 1996, USB has had three major revisions, with a fourth coming this year. And USB is the great, a great example of an evolution of a standard, increasing speed, bandwidth, and power use over several iterations whilst remaining backwards compatible. And the evolution is clear when you look at the various USB connectors. I'm sure everybody has a favourite up here. <laughs> and I think we can all agree that this is the worst one. <laughs> and I'd never even heard of this one until I did the research for this talk. Now, despite the differences with these connectors, with the right adapter, you can connect any one to any other and it will still work. A good data standard should follow this approach. And like USB, must know when to deprecate standards. It takes a concerted effort and many revisions for standards to become ubiquitous. In data circles, it sometimes feels like we're all striving for the Type-C connector, but we haven't been through this rubbish yet. I don't really have strong opinions on the outsourcing of digital services, except when it comes to the entities, lists of things, and the language of organisations. It should be theirs to design, manage and evolve. My team and I spend a lot of our time talking to subject matter experts, digging to uncover the meaning behind terms, why they exist in the way that they do so that we can document them and try and propagate a bit of a shared understanding around the agency. Now, sometimes the source material could be better, but John has inadvertently torpedoed my next argument completely with his presentation. <laughs> at, in government, you're at the mercy of legislation and policy. Turns out it's really good. But describing things accurately using only words is really difficult. Your policy depends on understanding the legislation clearly, and data models tend to line up roughly with policy. So a good example of the FSA is the definition of an establishment. An establishment could be a cold store or cutting plant, now that's an approved establishment, or a dairy, which is a registered establishment. A food business could be an establishment, and sometimes you might hear people talking about establishment and premises interchangeably. Sometimes getting definitions right means going back to first principles and reading the legislation. And like everything else, that takes a long time. There are plenty of good examples where meaning or definition really matter. But there are times where people's expectations don't match with semantics and it can be quite jarring for them. Have a look at this one. Everyone got that? Really clear? Now, I imagine for most folk, the difference here feels pedantic. Defining meaning is important, but so is understanding the context in which it exists in the real world. And this is an area that I think is really difficult but worthwhile to make progress in, and also an area that I really don't have any good answers for. So, answers on a postcard, please. We're good at describing the tangible properties of data. We're reasonably good at describing the contextual elements of data, such as the methodology used to gather it. 
Today's challenge is to establish best practice for qualitative metadata, the strengths and weaknesses of a method of connection or a field in the dataset, its potential biases and the rationale behind the creation of it. How do we describe those nuances that are exposed so easily when you talk to a subject matter expert for 10 minutes? Tomorrow's challenge is to make that qualitative metadata machine readable because improving that qualitative metadata does nothing to address the ever increasing volumes of data. We need registers more than ever. Rather than thinking of them as a thing, I prefer to think of them as a public commitment to transparency and stability through good governance with a regular cadence. Establishing good governance principles within your organisation around the ownership, management, maintenance and sharing of reference data is most important and often most difficult. Who's ever been in a meeting where someone says, oh, we've got some data on that? And then who's been in that same meeting where they decide to collect a fresh set at the end anyway? <laughs> data entropy manifests itself as distrust. A reasonably reliable workaround is just properly cataloguing your data and again keeping on top of it, but this is boring, time consuming uh, and takes a lot of overhead. And another area where there's frequently a blind spot is understanding how and where your services, processes and data connect. So this is uh, an outline of some work I've been doing to understand the FSA's data ecosystem in more detail. The FSA is not a large organisation, yet this is all the stuff I've uncovered in my first pass. I know things are missing, and we want to include data and services from third parties and prospective data sources too. This is another time-consuming activity, speaking to subject matter experts and colleagues to pick apart <coughs> excuse me, uh, where and how services connect takes time. This is starting to have an effect already because we can tell what our most common data entities are. We can see where there's redundancy and dependency and where the data flows. So, this stuff is still hard, but things are changing. For starters, you're here at an event to examine and celebrate the good work going on across government data, and that's no small thing. I feel like we're approaching an inflection point. People know standards are critical, we just need to make them easier to implement. Reference data and registers make sense, documentation is improving. The private sector is tackling a whole bunch of challenges that we can beg, borrow, steal from. I grew up in Newquay, the home of UK surfing. And there's an offshore reef there, um, which in the right conditions can create some of the largest surfing waves in Europe. The reef and the wave it forms is known as the cribar. But for the cribar to appear, you need the right conditions. You need the right tide, the right wind, and the right time between waves. You can find footage of people surfing the cribar on the internet. It's impressive and frightening in equal measure, but the one thing it never shows is the sheer effort it takes surfers to paddle out to get past the break just for a chance to catch that wave. And I think we are still paddling out, but we're nearly there. And if we don't keep going, we'll just miss the wave altogether, and we wouldn't want to do that now, would we? Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know. Stand there. Uh, who would like to ask the first questions about that? I you'd fix it in eight minutes. You, fix, you fixed it. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, we've got a question there. Anybody else in the first pass? And Dan here as well. Uh, given your mention of the importance of registers, um, what's your encouragement to GDS for the next steps of the registers project, which seems a bit in question? And Dan here as well. Uh, Sui Lang Harris from the Legal Education Foundation again. Um, really enjoyed the talk. I uh, was curious about the uh, barriers in terms of uh, political will amongst internal stakeholders to getting these uh, basics and fundamental issues right. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, on the registers piece, I think that... So my opinion is that departments, agencies should just start doing it. Um, we've tried to do some of that with our reference data and I think the thing that's always worth bearing in mind with reference data is it's important but quite often the usage is really narrow. It might only be of use to two or three teams or it might be used to one company out there somewhere but there's no reason not to publish it because you're essentially creating a, a, a nice neat record of the state of things in your list. It's much better structured and published somewhere by you um, than in a spreadsheet on someone's desktop. Uh, if GDS 
improve the register's offering, as it were, then that's great. I'm all for that. I'm all for anything that sh shortcuts. You really want subject matter experts to be owning, maintaining the registers and it not be a technical challenge, first and foremost. Um, getting buy-in from senior stakeholders. I'm really lucky. I've already got that buy-in. I've, um, I've got the backing to, to make improvements. I, I actually think that the bigger challenge is folks on the ground getting them to accept it. Back, registers is a classic example. Somebody may have a list of um, things that we use. I say, oh, this would make a great register. And they go, oh, that sounds like work, Adam. And I go, well, it will be a little bit to start with. And they go, no, I'm out. <laughs> so <laughs> I, was at a, I was at a data architecture working group earlier today, and um, there was a lot of talk about getting the top down to uh, mandate or have a stick. And a stick's useful, but I, I do think that data in government as a community has yet to really show people the carrot. And we still haven't worked out what the carrot actually looks like. Your day-to-day -day working life will be better, okay? I mean, <laughs> there's only so far I can go. So I haven't come up with the answer to that, and I don't know if anyone else has, but I, I would love to hear the answer to that if anyone's got it. Thank you. Uh, next set of questions. Uh, Sam over there again. Anybody else? And uh, a couple of raising friends as well. Hi, uh, Sam Tesman, Ministry of Justice. Um, so I really enjoyed your talk, uh, and I was struck by what you said about documentation being sort of human readable, and we want to move really ad ideally towards a machine readable for this stuff. Um, how much do you think this challenge is fundamentally about a technological solution that allows? I guess, machine-readable metadata of the type you've said, and also for actual users of the data or these subject matter experts to be able to update and improve this data on the fly. Thank you. And two rows in front. Ira Bolichevsky, Data Consultants. Um, great talk, really loved it. Thank you. And uh, I was actually going to ask, love the wave metaphor, what is it going to look like when we're surfing the wave? Um, but that kind of comes back to what you, were, what you were saying about carrots and like what is what is that cell? What is that carrot, carrot to government? Um, and if you don't have a kind of good sense of what riding that wave looks like, how do you think we might find out? Because I think that is one of the things that is missing. Thank you very much. I think it's nearly all weighted towards the human side. Um, I think making things machine readable is actually far easier than making things human readable um, because the, the machines will do what you tell them to essentially until we get to the point where they're telling us what to do, but I imagine that's not that far away. Um, I, I'm a great believer in plain English documentation that is presented at the point of contact. So uh, there was recently a conversation on Twitter where somebody asked, how do you know if your data catalog is successful? And my answer was that somebody can look at a data set and assess whether it will be of use to them or not without ever having to download it. So I think if you can do that, then the machine part actually is, is just a reasonably, reasonably easy technology uh, question. Uh, what does the wave look like? I think it looks like somebody in a policy team who is doing a piece of work or some research is able to find data from another government department, assess whether it's of use to them or not, use it and get an answer without ever having to ring someone up, write a data sharing agreement, go through security controls. They can do it in an afternoon. I think that's what the wave looks like when it gets here because it's freely available and it's interoperable and it connects with data that they already have. And we've got time for a final question or two, I think. Gentleman there, anybody else? And the lady here as well. Oh, uh, can we take the jet with the microphone first and then we'll come to you in a second. Um, I, th I think you said that organizations need to own their own data model. Was that the phrase you used? Just wonder if you could talk about what happened, what goes wrong when they don't and what goes right when they do. Uh, it's Joe Baker from Kimberview. Thank you. And 
I was going to say, in terms of data sharing, what's going to happen with European data if there's no deal? Good luck, Adam. <laughs> so you, it manifests itself as the kind of example I gave with establishment. An establishment, when you do it right, you define, in this case, an establishment as the overall entity and the approved, registered, and other kinds of establishment as a sort of uh, a subdivision of that entity because it's you need to remember that people, quite often, a business will look at the same thing through a slightly different lens. Um, that often manifests as we went to a supplier and bought this system for this and this system for this, and they don't even call it an establishment in the same system. Um, I, I think it should help. If, if you have really good enterprise data models, it should help sh support design uh, and delivery of services, because that documentation is already there. You can shortcut making that bit up again. Um, as for the uh, bit about EU data, I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, with 30 seconds to go, I think we probably should leave it there. But uh, Adam, thank you very much thank indeed. You. And our final presentation of the evening from Ben from the NAO. Thank you. Just click the middle uh, one. Just click you? the one on the right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ben Coleman. Uh, I work at the National Audit Office. I am a data analytics lead there. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about our bright and shiny data service. So, this is something we've developed in house to kind of deal with some of the issues about the way that we consider government releases statistics and data uh, as kind of open data releases. So a little bit about the NEO. Uh, I won't spend too long on this, given the time, and I know some of you will know about this already. Two streams to the NEO's work, financial audit work, 350 accounts audited a year, uh, and then our value for money work, which is our kind of high-profile public-facing work, uh, where we are looking at the effectiveness, efficiency, and economy of government spending. Uh, we have about 60 reports a year, value for money reports, and more kind of factual-based investigations. Uh, and the bottom bit is the key bit for me. These reports tend to draw upon a, a kind of a wide range of evidence published by government departments and other bodies. Often we'll get our own custom cuts of data from departments, uh, but we do rely on published materials as well. So we are therefore a big user of government statistics and related data sets. Um, now, my kind of talk is about our kind of local solution to the way that government publishes data, which implies that there are some problems <laughs> uh, as, we, as we see it in terms of the way government publishes data. Now, I'm conscious haven't got a huge amount of time to <laughs> this, this bit could go on forever. But uh, okay, so problem number one, inconsistent use of identifiers, right? So many of you, I don't know if, you, if you're kind of users of government data, but you'll be kind of familiar with this. So here's an example here. Uh, MOJ data, prison population, uh, published uh, monthly. MOJ data, prison staffing, all right? No codes applied, just names of prisons and entities Matching them together, which is something we do in the data service, difficult, right? Yeah? Often the names will be the same. Uh, other times, the names will be slightly different. And we're then guessing, is Elmley the same as Elmley Bracket Sheppey? Is the Vern 4 the same as the Vern? Presumably it is. Uh, one issue. Uh, that's just within kind of one department. Uh, if you go across a lot of departments, this is the number of different spellings and, and ways of talking about Bath and North East Somerset <laughs> that we have come across. Uh, when we've been using, the, uh, developing the data service in only the last uh, four years or so, and we're not covering kind of all data in the data service, it's just things that are relevant to our studies. Uh, often, local authorities obviously will have e codes, the MNS e codes. Where they don't, uh, oft, some of them still don't, we'll be going off the names and then trying to match up on that basis, and it can be difficult. Uh, so that's kind of across different departments. You also get issues within the same statistical series, right? So this is data about civil service people surveys, so staffing data. Uh, how, how kind of agreeable are people to their manager? What do they think about their paying conditions? Uh, this comes from one release, multiple tabs, right, for each year in an attempt to give you an ability to create a time series. Uh, but note that uh, the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Agricultural Science in 2009 suddenly became Centre of Environment, Food and Agricultural Science in 2010, switched back, 2011, 2012, then it jumped down to Luster Environment Part, Centre for Fisheries, Aquaculture, and then back to 
the food and agriculture. Uh, now, I don't think they are all mog changes, name changes. I think that is uh, a definitional problem, a spelling problem, uh, a person putting this stuff in manually problem. Same sort of thing, national savings and investment, jumping around three different versions, even within the same Excel file, multi-tabs, create a time series if you want, but you're going to have to sort out our inconsistencies first. So that's one issue. Difficult formats is another one that we come across a lot. So if you're looking to get one single number out of a lot of government stats, it's often quite easy. If you're trying to do more than that and kind of reuse that data, it can be more difficult. Here's one example. Local government finance is coming out a little bit blurred there. This is local government financing data. Classic uh, kind of publication arrangement, big Excel file, uh, merged column headings, cascading column headings. Uh, makes it quite difficult to then reuse that data and link it to something else. Uh, another example here, so this is uh, the prison staffing data again. This one, same data in the table. For some reason, there's a big kind of page break added in, just for good measure, right? <laughs> so if you want to print it out, great. If you want to pick a number out, great. If you want to kind of take all that data in one go and redo something with it, more difficult. You've got to spend time getting rid of all that blank space. Seems a bit pointless. Uh, time series spread across many years. So another issue we come across. So this is some CLG data. Uh, they have a, it's this data actually. So this is the spending data. That's part of a much bigger spreadsheet, set of spreadsheets covering all aspects of spending on roads, transport, uh, hospitals, which is schools. And they all sit within separate bits on gov.uk, separate sheets, multi-tabs, not in a single thing. If you want to do a time series on this CLG data, you've got to take data from here, 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 here. There are multi-tabs in each. I added them up, there's 91 different Excel spreadsheets you would have to pull together to do a time series on every metric that they publish. Uh, and occasionally you also get data as text. So here's an example here. This is the prison stuff again, not as well on that. Uh, in 2015, more recently they've changed it, but they were publishing this data as a text file. Revisions is another issue. I'm just slightly conscious of the time. So uh, revisions aren't always well publicized. So here we've got some adult social care data published on the 25th of October 2017, and then in March it's revised. We have a little helpful note coming in here. But over on gov.uk, on their stats release page, uh, there's no mention of that revision. Right? And in particular, if like us, you're kind of conscious about things might change, you might subscribe to the feed here, and you might try and get your email alerts, but you don't get them because gov.uk doesn't tell you that the thing has changed. You'll have to go here to find the thing has changed, which you're not, you can't spend every day checking, checking, checking. right? <laughs> So impact on us, on users, more generally, this is the often quoted stat, 80% of time data analytics uses are spent cleaning, finding data, not a lot of time left to actually using it. And that is what held true for, for us in the NEO. We were spending kind of too much time cleaning up data, decreasing our efficiency, increasing the quality risks, reducing the time we had available for doing stuff with that data. So we decided back in 2015 to develop this internal solution, the data service, takes the form of an internal data warehouse. Uh, we've got now 500 statistical kind of measures. So each one of those things we looked at before is like a measure. The prison population data is a measure. Uh, drawn from published data sets, uh, and we maintain it in a central team. So we do kind of all the cleaning, and importantly, we do the conforming centrally. So we have a set of common dimensions uh, kind of arranged like this. So we arrange our data in a kind of classic uh, fact and dimensions data warehouse model. You have your facts, which are your numbers. You have your dimensions, which are your, your unique breakdowns of things against that data. And then by doing that, it means you can take other data, like your sentences data and your spend data, and by snapping them to the same common dimensions, you can build a link there, and you can do some subsequent analysis much more easily. So we've kind of conformed government data into that structure, using a set of pipeline scripts, and importantly, using an, an evolved set of synonyms, which we've developed over time to kind of aid that confirmation process and we have a little pipeline uh, to help us do that. Uh, and then the thing itself, I know I've only got a few seconds, so the thing itself uh, presents itself to our teams internally through a, an interactive web-based app built with R in-house. Uh, data linkages are kind of exploited through that as well, so a user can select data set A, data set B, the data will be joined behind the scenes, they will be able to play with the data as if it was from the same source. A kind of pivot table-esque functionality, really, but in an app. 
Uh, we have a related SharePoint site around metadata, and we're looking to kind of develop this thing further. So this, is, this was set up in 2015, started quite small, agile, built it over time. We now have those 500 measures, uh, and we are looking to add more features to this. For example, people in the rest of our business, so the rest of the NEO, to be able to load data into this central service themselves, again, using our synonyms and our systems. Uh, I did have a little demo of it, but I will save that in case anyone wants to ask, <laughs> I guess. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> Who'd like to ask the first questions? So we've got three down here. Uh, so go with Adam, and then we'll go back a row, and then back another row. I always like to ask um, the with the eighty percent of uh, analysts' time being used cleaning data. As a data architect, I can do one thing for you to get it to 75%. What would you pick? Thank you. And if you just pass it behind you. <coughs> Thanks, uh, Devon, again from Policy and Practice. As the auditor responsible for more effective government, when you solve these problems for yourselves using your internal app, to so what extent do you ensure that the governments themselves, the government departments themselves that have had these problems internally or externally actually apply what you've learned and can you? Thank you. And the road behind. Hello, Simon from Register Dynamics. Um, we, this is a, a common problem we see quite a lot. I guess the question is, is there any way that um, other people can take the wonderful clean data that you've made and use it outside of the NAO? Are you able to make that externally available? And if not, why not? Thank you very much. All right, OK, so on the, the 80 to 75% thing, there are obviously those bugbears we went through before. If I had to pick one, I would say formats. So departments releasing data in a format that uh, is a kind of a reusable format. Okay, so obviously they're all kind of reusable in that they are Excel and things like that, but in a format which is not made for printing, yeah, but a format that's made with an expectation that people might actually want to be reusing this material and linking it to another department's material on the same, you know, on the same dimensions. So that would be my, my kind of number one. And then after that, the, the kind of inconsistent uh, identifiers. But we've kind of got a solution for that because we've built our synonyms over time, essentially, which kind of deal with that. Um, the second one about the kind of uh, passing the information back to departments. We have done a little bit of that, I think, but we probably haven't done as much as we could in terms of uh, kind of passing back the knowledge we found when reusing or trying to reuse Department X's statistics and having trouble with that. Uh, that's something we're looking to do more of uh, as we go forward. One of the things we did do early doors is we kind of registered an interest in the stats and said, hey, guys, we're going to be using your stats. Uh, we sent them some information about what we were doing. And the main reason for that was the expectation that we might get notified if things would change as we kind of like are now a registered user of that stat. That didn't happen. <laughs> uh, things, were, things changed. Uh, not just kind of like identifiers, but the whole format in which things were published, the frequency in which things were published. Uh, there was no kind of notification process going on. But certainly, we could do more around kind of helping departments improve their, uh, their presentation layouts through feeding back the kind of issues we've experienced. So that's something we want to do. Releasing this thing externally, uh, it is something I'm happy to say that we are currently exploring. Uh, we did look at it a couple of years ago, decided against it. Uh, but we have a new uh, controller and auditor general now in place, uh, and we are hoping to kind of revisit that, those aspects uh, with him uh, and kind of, yeah, watch this space, I think. Fantastic. Next set of questions. At the back there, and the two gentlemen here as well. I, I won't admit which one it is, but I'm responsible for one of those uh, uh, <laughs> I, inconsistent identifiers uh, that, that you displayed. Um, but it's, sort of, it's partly a reflection on, on the question that just came about publishing, um, but it also connects to sort of the, the, how easy it is for, for analysts to actually construct and publish data um, from government in, 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 a, in a sort of useful system, I guess. It's more of a reflection that, um, one, there's not an agreed sort of standard on how a machine-readable format is, is published um, and how we, how we go around conventions like actually variable names and things like that when on a published table you have the, the, the sort of nice human-readable format. 
And so I think there's a, there's a piece there about what that looks like. And connected to that also, sort of the role of what gov, uh, data.gov.uk should be or something, should there actually be sort of a bit like you have on the ONS, you can go into their quite complicated time series sort of database thing. Can you, should we not be striving ultimately for something that's across government like that? Thank you. Hi, it's um, Sam from Roger again. Um, so I think you've shown with great clarity some problems with the way data is shared by different departments. Uh, I wonder if you had any comments about how reproducible some of these numbers are likely to be in the way they've been created in the first place, uh, and whether you think that maybe the analysis that underpins them might also not be reproducible, or, or whether that's a problem. Thank you. And if you could pass it just in front. Kevin McConroy, Open University. Um, two linked things. Uh, one is, I can see how the way you've set up this, um, this warehouse in the data service makes very good sense for things which you're going to have to return to time and time again, um, which obviously you have to do a lot. Uh, I just wondered how easily extensible it was for ad hoc new bits of data collection that you might need for a, uh, a, a particular value for money project or something like that. And, and kind of linked to that, this is, this is a half-baked thought. I spent quite a lot of time working with journalists, data journalists and investigative journalists. Data journalists have a lot of tools for doing this kind of thing, which in my experience people outside that area don't know very much about. Have you got involved in that? Because if you haven't, I suggest you might ask some of them. Thank you very much. Right, yes, so in terms of the kind of the, the analyst's perspective, I totally get that. So I, before joining the NEO, I worked as a government statistician. I was producing similar kind of materials. Uh, it didn't particularly dawn on me that people might want to reuse my materials and link it with another department's data. Uh, so I totally get that. Um, and whether the government should be striving to do something similar, I would say yes. Uh, and I have heard that the ONS are kind of trying to move in that direction. Uh, how far they've got in the most recent period, I'm not sure. But I know there are kind of moves afoot to, to kind of unify some of the data that government releases uh, and make it more easily kind of queryable and accessible. Uh, maybe others in the room might know more about the kind of latest state of that, of that project than, than me. Um, the reproducibility of the raw statistics. Um, yeah, I don't know. The, the data service doesn't really give us a, an angle on that, I would say. Uh, we are kind of consuming the materials that have been published by the departments and have been badged as national or official statistics. Um, what I would say is there are an awful lot of revisions that tend to go on, I have noticed, as a consumer of these statistics myself, uh, and that might be indicative of some of the, you know, of some issues underneath the hood, let's say. Uh, but I think it probably does vary wildly between, you know, between departments as to, as to the robustness of the, of the materials anyway and how they're collected. And then the third piece around the kind of ad hoc use in the data service, yes, that is definitely a kind of a challenge for us. So there is a time investment to get uh, data curated into our warehouse. Uh, so we tend not to put in ad hoc uses internally. We tend to see if the, the team who's requesting this data can go in, can make a case that they are going to come back to this in the future and therefore the kind of payoff, the time benefit payoff would come. Um, but we have kind of recently developed this load your own functionality which we think might help with that as well. So teams can curate effectively in a kind of controlled environment their own data uh, as well and cross tabulate it against what we've already hold in the main warehouse. The data journalism point, uh, I have not had any kind of dealings with data journalists around the tools that they have but uh, I would be kind of very kind of happy to be keen to pursue that I think. Excellent. Well, with 10 seconds to go, um, Ben, thank you very much indeed. Four brilliant presentations tonight, plenty to discuss over wine and canapes, which I will not keep you from for very much longer. Uh, we will also head to the pub afterwards, if anybody's still around. Um, a few things before we go. Uh, the next one of these will be on the 6th of November. Please do tell lots of people to come along and live stream. We really want to build a community about this and keep this event series going. If you would like to sponsor or know somebody who would like to sponsor a future Data Bytes event, please do let me know. And finally, three thank yous. First of all, to all of you for coming and being such a wonderful and engaged audience. Second, to the Legal Education Foundation for supporting tonight's event. And finally, last but not least, please join me in thanking our four brilliant presenters this evening. Thank you very much indeed.